appreciate it, bro. Enjoy. Thank you. How y'all doing today? So Danny went a little long. I've got like 10 minutes. Rather than going through my slides, I'm just going to do my bodybuilding posing routine. Is that all right with you? All right, so keto optimization. I'm going to talk about getting shredded, but the main thing I want to kind of illustrate with this is, you know, a lot of people get into keto to lose weight. They get into keto to help with, you know, cancer prevention, um, you know, mental clarity, and it helps with performance as well, but there's like this weird caveat that people like throwing out there that it's, it's going to suffer a little bit. Like your, your performance is going to suffer a little bit with keto. You have to have some carbs. Uh, so Danny and I are kind of like a little counter on this one. Um, but I'm going to show how you don't have to sacrifice that. You don't have to sacrifice your performance. You don't have to sacrifice what you're capable of when you go keto. If anything, it all benefits. So let's just dive into it. A um, little bit about me. Kind of as he said, I, uh, I've been bodybuilding for 10 years as a natural bodybuilder. I've been keto for five, and uh, Crystal and I met in Washington, and I was just miserable. I was with the railroad, actually. I was a management job, and I quit that because it wasn't fulfilling to me, and I was depressed. I was, like, way in debt, and I was unhealthy. I had a bunch of eating disorders from following a standard bro bodybuilding diets my whole life, and it just wasn't sustainable. It wasn't healthy, and I wasn't fulfilled. So I went out in the woods and meditated one day, and I'm like, what can I do to add the most value, have the biggest impact, and feel good about the life that I'm living? And I love bodybuilding, I love nutrition, I love keto, because I just stumbled upon it at that time, and it was able to help me with my eating disorders, and uh, just my mental clarity and everything. I mean, I was not depressed anymore, and so we just started doing this. We started putting out content, the podcast, the YouTube video, started experimenting with different things. I started doing a bodybuilding competition with keto and gained some traction doing that. And it's turned into this amazing journey. I mean, I've got like a crew that works with me now and like we're all family. I mean, I'm standing up on the stage right now in Omaha, Nebraska with all you wonderful people in front of me. Like I feel so incredibly blessed. I mean, huge shout out to Jay and Jamie and everybody involved to make this thing happen because y'all are why this is happening. So thank you first and foremost. Um, quick disclaimer. So I'm not a doctor. I don't want to play one on the internet. There's some graphs that I made in here that are not scientific whatsoever. They just are kind of a good way to illustrate the point that I'm trying to get across. Um, so me being a natural bodybuilder, how does that give me any credibility from like a nutritional standpoint? And it's interesting because like you look at a lot, of, a lot of scientific studies and they're, they're shorter, especially the, the keto studies. There are not very many long-term keto studies and they can't really get approved to do a lot of the studies because a lot of the studies are based off of um, you know, food surveys, like they're polling people, okay, what do you eat? But people don't really adhere to that oftentimes. So it's kind of hard to get really good data. Uh, I feel like as a natural bodybuilder, I'm tracking every single macronutrient that I intake. I'm tracking all my training. I'm tracking everything day in, day out for months at a time. And since I have clients, I've been able to do the same thing with them. So I've got a pretty good scope for how this affects humans. Um, I'm just kind of excited to share some of that with you. So I'm going to get some fundamentals out of the way first. If you're in this room, I assume you're probably in the, the group that thinks that keto and fat adaptation is superior to being carb dependent. Hopefully we're all in agreement there. Regarding calories, calories is a big debate. A lot of people think it's all hormone related. A lot of people think it's all calorie debated. There's just a lot of confusion there. And you don't have to count calories depending on what your goals are. But your energy intake, your fuel intake has an impact. So hopefully we're all on the same page there. And then I kind of want to dive into this 80-20 analysis of like whole foods because I'm up here speaking one, one truth and like, like I said earlier, we all keto our own way, but there's so many different ways to go about it that if you've got so many people talking, it's super easy to get confused and not really know which way to take things. But I, I imagine that everybody that's going to be speaking today or any other day or any conference for that matter is in the agreement that like if you follow a ketogenic whole foods approach, that's going to be the most bang for your buck, not the processed stuff. So what that may look like in the classic 80-20 analysis form is 20% of your effort will yield 80% of your results. If you want to just optimize, uh, like if you're coming from a standard American diet, if you're unhealthy, if you're overweight, if you're not feeling good, you got a lot of uh, chronic illnesses, if you just optimize, get out the processed foods and eat whole natural foods with you know, a good quality fat source and enough adequate protein, that's going to be 80% of your benefit right there. So... If you're not there, then prioritize that before you listen to anything else I'm about to say. Okay, so this is, again, one of those kind of graphs that I just 
threw up. Um, standard American diet, you're losing headway. So this is the 80-20, you're losing headway. If it fits your macros, flexible dieting, you're at least conscious of nutrition, so you're kind of making a little bit of headway there. The zone diet, you're kind of covering all your bases and getting a little bit of everything. The whole food diet, that's where you're getting that 80% of your benefit. But what if you want that 100%? So I want to talk about that last 20%, that, that finite, like, the, the performance aspect of things. All right, so let's talk about these a little bit. If you're trying to get that last 20%, I feel like nutrition is, is key, obviously, but you've got to have some training in there. You've got to have some muscle stimulus. You have to activate the body and give it reason to push for that 100% output. So this is another graph that I've kind of pulled up. We got CKD, we got TKD, we got metabolic flexibility, we got carnivore, we got strict keto. I've got training equated across all because I don't want it to be favorable to one or the other. So training is equated for them. And I know I put strict keto above carnivore. Let me explain, Dr. Baker. <laughs> all right, so CKD, a little uh, brief history on that. So basically a cyclical ketogenic diet, one or two days of higher carbs, the rest of the week being keto. My issue with this is that you're kind of in purgatory. You're kind of in limbo. You're never really going to optimize your body's use of the carbs. You're never really going to optimize your body's use of the ketones and the fat. So you're kind of just in a constant state of purgatory, which is not optimal, in my opinion. It gives you more variety. So if you want to kind of mix things up, you have that as a benefit, but not necessarily for optimization. TKD, targeted ketogenic diet, you're having a small increase in carbs, usually around your workout, whether it be intra, uh, pre or post, and you're, you're not really ever dipping out of ketosis with this, ideally, but again, it's kind of acting as a crutch because it's not forcing your body to really maximize for ketones and fat as the primary driver from a performance standpoint. Metabolic flexibility, so this is like super hot right now, it's, I mean, and importantly so, it's a good topic. People need to be metabolically flexible. Being metabolically flexible coming from a standard American diet is a huge step in the right direction. But I would argue that if you're trying to optimize for keto, you're not going to see that by incorporating a bunch of carbs as you would if you're trying to be able to do both things. I mean, from an evolutionary perspective, we should be able to eat both things and our, our bodies be able to function with both fuel substrates. But it's, again, kind of acting like a crutch. It's going to be like the jack-of-all-trades philosophy. You're not really going to master your ketogenic performance if you're incorporating carbs still. Carnivore. I think carnivore, I mean, I pretty much tend to go a carnivore-esque approach. Um, you're eliminating all the noise, all the crap. You can be strict keto while carnivore and vice versa. Um, it's really good for people autoimmune, digestive issues and whatnot. My only knock against carnivore is that for some, it's so, it's so limited in what you can eat. Again, there's a million different options out there, but some people like more variety than what carnivore offers. And it's a little bit harder to manipulate your protein to fat ratios if you're really trying to get it dialed in. If you're just being instinctive and that's what you're trying to optimize for, then I'm all for carnivore. But my argument for strict keto is that you're basically getting a lot of those benefits that you're getting from carnivore, but you have a few other compounds like MCT oil, as an example, that you can use for you know, manipulating what your nutritional goals are to benefit your overall performance based off of what your performance goals are. So this is, I want to kind of take a little break here and talk about human generalization versus optimization. So first of all, if you're in that 80-20 category and you're doing whole foods, you're doing keto, you're eating quality nutrition, you're already optimized compared to all the vast majority of the human population out there. But, and this is another caveat here, your personal level of what you're striving to do, what your goals are, is going to be your personal thing. It's going to be different for everybody. Like, I have no right to say that my way is better than your way if you have a different goal than me. From a business perspective, if you like watching Netflix every day and you're happy in your nine to five or happy in your job, you find fulfillment, then more power to you. Like, that's awesome. I'm happy for you. If you are unhappy in your nine to five, you want to build a business and you're spending all your evenings watching Netflix, then you've got a problem. The same thing is true with your diet and nutrition. If you're happy with where you are, if you're happy with who your health is, then you can like dabble in a little bit of everything, mix and match things. If you're feeling good, you're feeling good. There's no reason to look down upon that. But for me personally, I want to be the best at my craft. I want to be the master at what I'm trying to do. I want to be the world's greatest natural ketogenic bodybuilder. 
And whatever that is for you, I want you to feel like you can optimize for that with a strict keto approach. So, I like this quote by Jocko. I had to throw it up here because I felt it was fitting. If you stop looking for a shortcut and find your discipline and your will, then you will find your freedom. And I live my life by that day in, day out. Like when I was unhappy with my life and started building a business, I'd sacrifice everything that did not lead me to that. When I was unhappy with my nutrition and my health, I sacrificed everything that did not lead me to better health. So I made this flow chart because I think it kind of illustrates a little bit of the point I'm trying to get across here. So first of all, I get asked all the time, how do I build muscle and lose body fat? And you could do both, but you're going to be way better off if you try to prioritize one because they somewhat compete for one another. If you're trying to build muscle, you have enough fuel coming in that you can build muscle tissue. So be in a caloric surplus, train hard, and you will be able to build muscle. There's a whole lot more we can go into there, but I'm gonna focus more so on the losing body fat and getting shredded aspect of things. Um, so it's really kind of a topic of controversy between high protein versus high fat. I personally gravitate more towards high fat, but again, it's all context dependent. So protein, I'm gonna dive into this in a little bit here, but protein is not a superior energy source. Fats and carbs are energy sources. So if you have a very low output of energy, if you're doing kind of more of a sedentary lifestyle, you're not training very hard, uh, you don't need that energy demand, then you're probably going to be better off gravitating more towards a higher protein, not necessarily higher than your fat, maybe higher than your fat, but you can get away with having higher protein relative to what other people would consider high fat. If you have a high output, like me, I'm training every day, I'm running every day, I'm training you know, two hours a day plus cardio, I'm in a competition prep right now, so my training has been elevated, I need more energy. So... For me, I'm going to benefit from having that higher fat ratio, which is more like a standard ketogenic ratio. So let's dive into this a little bit further here. Um, thermic effect of food. Thermic effect of food is one of the big arguments for higher protein. Protein high, has a higher thermic effect of food than carbs and fat. This is not really debated. That's pretty much fact. However, actually, let's just go through a couple more bullet points here. Um, Protein also has fewer calories uh, for the gram weight than fat does. So fat is nine. Again, this is kind of average because there's no exact way of knowing the exact caloric intake. We're not putting everything into a bomb calorimeter here. So this is just estimates. But protein has fewer calories than fat, all grams equal. Um, so for that reason, a lot of people argue that fats can be more, or proteins can be more satiating because you're getting more volume, and that is very true for some, but you're getting less energy. So... Like we said, you can make energy through protein, through gluconeogenesis, but it's not really an efficient process. So you're either going to get your energy from carbs or you're going to get your energy from fat. Again, hopefully we're all in the camp of fat. So this, these, i got four graphs coming here. They're kind of tricky, so bear with me here. This is what a graph of high protein would look like in the context of the thermic effect of food. Let's say your metabolic baseline stays constant and you're trying to lose body fat, so calories are dropping down. Because protein has a higher thermic effect of food, your net deficit is a little bit lower. So you're like you're losing, you're, you're taking in less than you're burning, basically, what this is trying to illustrate. Um, I made these graphs in like 30 seconds, so hopefully they look okay. Uh, this is high fat, and because high fat has a lower thermic effect of food, you're going to not have as much of a net deficit because you don't have that higher thermic effect of food that protein does. However, this is where it gets interesting. This is high protein with exercise. So you add exercise into the equation, and I'm just gonna use myself as an example. So my, I'm in a contest prep now, my calories are dropping, um, and I'm trying to ramp up my exercise, my energy expenditure, but this right here is what the vast majority of bodybuilders and fitness enthusiasts that are following a standard bro diet do. They have very high protein, very low carbs, uh, very low fat. I've competed with people that would go as far as to cut out all their uh, fish oil pills because they wanted to remove all fat from their diet. Of course, their testosterone tanks, everything tanks. But when they do that, your energy tanks as well. And when, you're, when you have decreasing energy, it's very hard to have increased activity. And your NEAT activity, so your non-exercise activity thermogenesis, just walking and moving around, decreases. This is why you see a lot of natural bodybuilders that are doing this high-protein diet look like zombies or just anybody, you don't have to be a natural bodybuilder, but if you're doing a super high protein diet, very minimal fat and very minimal carbs, 
I mean, you just don't have any good energy source, so you're going to walk around like a zombie. This is what high fat with exercise does. You're still going to have decreasing calories, but because you have more energy, you're by default going to have probably more neat activity than if you were to have very high protein relative to fat. You just have more energy coming in, and you're going to be able to perform in your day-to-day -day training much more effectively. And because you're burning more calories from that increased energy expenditure, your net deficit is greater. So this is why I would argue in favor of high fat if you're going to be doing more activity. All right, so what that looks like, let me just kind of give you like a play-by-play -play on a high-level view of what my cutting protocol looks like if you're trying to lose body fat, trying to get that last 20%. Um, you know, like that 100%, 80, 20 ounces, you're trying to get that last 20% and you're coming in from a healthy perspective to begin with. So first you're going to establish a protein threshold. Then you're going to taper, you're going to taper your total caloric intake. Then we're going to introduce ketogenic refeeds and then we're going to reverse diet. We're going to repeat as needed. This is like a, a cyclical thing. Like these, this is happening over a pretty extended period of time. So phase one. First and foremost, you've got to have a healthy caloric baseline to begin with. If you're trying to cut down and lose body fat, but you're already taking in 1,200 calories, which is like a floor, and you're not healthy, metabolically speaking, then you're not really in a good place to lose a bunch more uh, calories because there's not really any room to play with there. I see so many people chronically under-eating, and that's like the worst thing you can do. Uh, so phase one, what I like to do is basically increase my protein while I'm decreasing my dietary fat. And I do very small incremental changes. You don't want to have a huge drop in any one variable. Treat yourself like a scientific experiment. You don't want to have a million different variables going at once. You don't want to change everything at the same time because then you don't really know what lever you're pulling is having an effect on the changes you're seeing in your body. Track as many metrics as you can. Track your weight, track your measurements, track your strength, track your body fat if you have access to like a DEXA or an in-body. But you want to establish what your protein threshold is. And this is in the context of being in a caloric deficit and tapering down your calories. Like I can eat, you know, 300 grams of protein in the off season in a building phase when I'm at a surplus, but when I'm going into a deficit, my body's not going to respond that favorably to 300 grams of protein. So phase one, kind of all about finding your protein threshold. Phase two, you're basically cutting down calories both from protein and fat. So Back to phase one real quick, when you know you're hitting your protein thresholds, when you start seeing some adverse effects, some bloating, um, for me personally, like I'm 10 weeks into my contest prep and my weight has pretty much plateaued, my weight loss has plateaued, I'm sleeping a little bit less, my AM glucose is a little bit higher, ketones a little bit lower, you just start noticing a few things when you've reached that protein threshold, so that's a pretty good indicator that you need to switch to phase two. In phase two, you're still decreasing your calories, but you're taking it from both protein and fat. This is going to result in an increasing fat ratio. So total calories are still dropping, but your fat ratio relative to protein is increasing. So your energy is going to start ramping up because you have more energy relative to uh, your protein coming in. Um, let's see here. Main thing here is to be disciplined and consistent. I see so many people that are like all about just cheating whenever they can. They'll cheat whenever they can and that's just not good. I mean, this is a very sustainable diet. Like ketogenic lifestyle is a sustainable lifestyle. Like you're eating high quality foods, you're eating things that you know you should be eating. So if you are trying to like maximize that last 20% of your life, but you can't adhere to anything, then it's like you kind of got to work on one before the other. Um, phase three, at this point in a weight loss journey, calories are going to be at the lowest they've been. And whenever you downregulate your calories, you're going to downregulate your metabolism. That's just the way things work. Your body's smart, it adapts, it evolves. You start taking away the, vol the, the food, the fuel, then your body's going to slow down to be conservative of that. So what I've found to be very beneficial is a lot of people have carb refeeds in the bodybuilding world. I have a keto refeed. So basically a 30 to 40% increase in daily calories coming in the form of fats and proteins. And what that does is it basically jump starts your metabolism and gets things moving again so that you don't really plateau as much. Um, and then recognize that this is the last phase. So that brings me to phase four, which is crucial and I feel like is relevant to a lot of the people in this room. If you've tried to lose weight and you've stripped away calories chronically for years 
and you've stayed at a very low caloric intake for far too long, your metabolism is going to be in the tank and you have to reverse diet. You have to ramp up your fuel. You have to convince your body that it doesn't need to starve to death and to ramp up metabolism. And then when you do go back into a cut, your body's going to be much more, respon much more responsive uh, to any manipulations you make. I mean, there's, there's like a, a point in which your body bottoms out. Like if you're stripped calories for far too long, no matter what diet you're on, your body's like in survival mode. And then any, any food that you take in, it's like, I'm saving this for a rainy day, I'm just going to turn it automatically to fat because I don't know when I'm going to get any fuel back. You have to eat enough for long enough to convince your body otherwise to stop harboring that as fat. So what does this look like? This is what a, uh, a good illustration of this would be over a period of time. So like let's say this is a year, for instance. If you are down-regulating your calories, your metabolism is going to start going down. Your body fat is going to follow suit. Again, there's a whole lot more variables. There's hormones. There's a lot of environmental factors, but we're just talking about this right now. Um, and then you'll reach your lowest body fat. So like that, for me, would be the equivalent of the peak week of my contest prep. So that's when my calories are the lowest, so my metabolism is the lowest, so my body fat's the lowest. And then I need to start reverse dieting out of that because I can't stay. It's not sustainable to stay at 3% body fat forever. So I've got to reverse diet out of that. So when I do that, my calories go back up, my metabolism ramps back up, and my body fat also goes up, which is not a bad thing. I can build more muscle in that stage. Notice, though, that at the very top of that cycle, my calories are higher and my metabolism is higher than it was at the beginning, and my body fat is lower than it was at the beginning. This is what makes this sustainable. This is what makes it a cycle that you can stick with because each time you cycle through, your body's starting point is better off for it. You have a better baseline to work with. You have more calories to work with, more macronutrients to manipulate, and a lower body fat and better composition and better overall health going into the next cycle. That's why you keep getting better year after year after year if you follow a protocol similar to this. So, real quick, just to recap all of this, I said I'm going to be up here talking at this conference, other conferences, you're going to hear all kinds of people talking at this conference and other conferences. You have to apply this knowledge. I like this quote by Bruce Lee. Knowing is not enough, we must apply. Willing is not enough, we must do. I have this philosophy in life that... I mean, it's, it's moments and more. It's, I mean, you are going to die, like plain and simple. We are all going to die. We're going to be dead. We're going to be fertilizing daffodils before long. I want to fill that time, this opportunity on life, on this planet, with as much value as I can. I don't want to die with regret. I, was, I, I wrote this in my newsletter the other day, but I, was talk, I went to Apple to get my computer fixed. And the guy behind the counter, I started talking with him because I knew it was going to be like a four-hour visit. And he was like talking to me and I like started prying, started prying. And I asked him like, hey man, what did you used to do in, in your life prior to this? Like what, what brought you here? What are you excited about in life? What are you passionate about? Because it just seemed kind of like run down. So he started talking to me about this, this old podcast he hosted back in New York City with a bunch of his friends. And he was super excited about it. You could tell his, his spark in his eyes just lit up as he was talking about these former years. And he just had fun with it. He had enjoyed it. He couldn't stop talking about it. And then all of a sudden, the light faded. The glimmer died. And he's like, but the economy changed. And I gave it up. And now I'm doing this. And I could tell he was just filled with regret. You could tell that he just wanted to go back into doing that. So I'm like, hey, man, there's all kinds of opportunities now. Why don't you just start up a remote podcast and go do it? He's like, no, no, those times are gone. And I swore to myself, as I walked out of that building that I do not want to live a life and die on my deathbed and wish there was something else I could have done, would have done, should have done, and didn't. And I wish that upon all of you as well. We all have greatness inside of us. We're all freaking savages inside. You have to harness that in you. You have to make it yours in your own way, and you have to kick some ass in life. And that's all I've got.